We're going to move on now to the science of love. Barbara will be interviewing Dr. Amy Corbett of SUNY Cobalt Skill. See what you can learn. This is your science lesson of the day. We are back. The science segment today at Impact, we're going to talk about the science of love. Now we know what love feels like, or at least we hope we know what love feels like, but really there is a scientific basis of love. My guest today, Dr. Amy Corbett, welcome to the show. Hi Barbara, thanks for having me. Sure. Now you uh, are a local as well, mm -hmm. and you went to graduate school Studio locally. Albany, local, yep. And then after that you went to work at a local college. Right. I went from, I was at SUNY Albany to finish my PhD and just really liked the area. So I worked at Siena for a long period of time and the last few years I've been out at SUNY Cobleskill. So, and you are a professor of psychology. Correct. That's great. Yeah. So what, you're the perfect person to have here. I can fix my troubles and we can find <laughs> out about the science of love. It might take longer than this <laughs> I segment. Know, yeah, I true. <laughs> my troubles are vast and wide. <laughs> But we'll start with the most obvious question. What is love? When we talk about the science of love, what is it? Well, there's a few theories of love that you can talk about, but one of the most popular and well-supported ones is um, Sternberg's theory, which argues there are three components, intimacy, passion, and commitment. Okay, so intimacy, passion, and commitment. Mm -hmm. Gosh, without any one of those three, you're really in trouble. He does argue that consummate love includes all three, but that there are relationships that have either just one or two of the three, and that some are stronger than others as mm. you go through. What about the arc of a whole love relationship? How do those three play against each other? Well, if we argue commitment, I think everybody understands. Intimacy involves both physical intimacy, but very much it involves an emotional component that people don't think about, that emotional intimacy of sharing with each other. Um, and then passion is that fire, that physical tingling, heart mm. racing stuff that we all enjoy. We find that intimacy and passion have a curvilinear relationship. Meaning, if you have a long-term relationship, mm -hmm. how does it go? That it starts, you know, all relationships start at zero. Intimacy and passion come up and they peak, and then the longer the relationship, it kind of tails off, mm. unfortunately. <laughs> Commitment starts at the bottom and tends to continue to grow, which we see in those long-term committed relationships that people really rely upon each other and rely upon the relationship. Sure. And I'm sure there are peaks and valleys of, commi of commitment and passion as we go through our lives, too, in those arcs. We can rediscover our love with one another um, as we go through. And what we find is that those people who put a concerted effort into their relationship will find those ways to maintain that passion and that intimacy with each other as time goes on. It does take work, though. It takes work. Mm. So what about desire? Can we actually pigeonhole desire and, and put it differently than love, for example? To a certain extent, if you look at the endocrinology of love, we find that most of that desire or lust or that end of things, it seems to be um, really pinned on testosterone. So it's hormone driven. I mean, obviously there are other triggers that mm -hmm. make us desire one another. Mm -hmm. For example, I understand there are visual cues that can spark desire. Absolutely. We like people who are like us, both similar to us in personality, but also very similar in um, physical composition, coloring, facial structure, even things, but facial asymmetries. Hmm. Like if my eyes don't line up perfectly, and we're talking about like micrometers off. But I like somebody else whose eyes maybe ah. not quite there. It's very interesting. That's cool. So then the hormones come mm -hmm. into play, and we can map those hormonal responses and call them desire? To a certain extent, our, that passion or lust or that physical desire comes from testosterone. And then the other components of the relationship that have to do with bonding and a desire to be together and spend time together that are not quite as physical, um, or not quite as sexual, I guess I should say, are based more on vasopressin, which is a hormone, and also oxytocin, which used to be very much tied, or still is very much tied to that mother-child bond, but we find very much present in romantic relationships. As so well. if I remember oxytocin is secreted like when a woman breastfeeds her mm -hmm. baby but it also you're saying it's not just a mother-child bond that it's also a man-woman bond or in a relationship bond. Correct. That when we think about those people that we care the most about or that we have the strongest relationship with oxytocin tends to be, tends to be released then as well. So mm -hmm. it, it really seems to be a bonding thing that we find in humans as well as in 
voles and all kinds of things when they look at, look at the relationships between monogamous voles, apparently, and there are other species that are polygamous voles. If you take the polygamous vole and give him oxytocin, he stays. Oh, no kidding. Oh, yeah, he stays oh. loyal after that. I see an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> How much That's oxytocin it. do you Ding. have? <laughs> it's time for your dart, honey. <laughs> I don't think you see anybody who's prettier mm -hmm. than me on TV, yes. So uh, love is really a complex thing. I mean, to define love, uh, people have been trying to do that in art and in literature for thousands of years. Also, whenever you're in a relationship, you kind of put the finger up and you say, is this love, is this not love? Mm -hmm. So how does that complexity of love really bear out in the science of it all? Well, we find it's challenging to truly map a spot for love. I think a lot of researchers were really hoping to find that one section of the brain that lights up like a oh, light bulb. Thank God you're talking about the brain when you yeah. say one spot for love. Okay. <laughs> but we find that it's really this sort of myriad pattern that activates multiple areas in our brain that are related to different things. Areas related to emotion, for example. Um, also related to arousal, like the amygdala, that's very much just related to us being more aroused. Um, related to commitment, related to sort of our preferences like we referred to before, mm -hmm. that's really the only time the cortex comes into play is when we're um, choosing if you have those characteristics that I really look for. After that, the cortex kind of shuts down. Which is the thinking part of the brain, if we want to call it that. But it's something that is subconscious. A lot of us don't say, well, I want somebody, let's just pick it a guy, I want a guy with a big nose and a strong chin. You don't right. really think that way, you're just kind of attracted to that person that way. But still, it's your thinking brain, huh? Thinking brain chooses, and then the rest of your brain decides whether you're motivated enough, if you become motivated to approach that person or to work towards a relationship. So it's very much in a, a goal-directed, motivational, emotional thing, mm. that all in one piece. Now what about familial love versus romantic love, partnership love versus, say, mother-daughter mm -hmm. or, or so on and so forth? Do they really change at all, our responses, whether we're talking about a relationship with our children, for example, or a relationship with our spouse? There are some differences, obviously, the sexual component is huge, but a lot of the commitment aspect that is similar, um, a lot of the commitment aspect, rather, is similar in a familiar relationship. Even our very, very close friends, if I reflect back to Sternberg, if you think about your best friend in the whole world, and you probably have a very committed and very intimate relationship with them, non-sexual, but very much emotionally intimate. Mm -hmm. And so that, those aspects are very, very similar for families, very close friends, and our romantic partners. We just generally add that um, physical, compassion, physical component that is also an intimate component that sharing that becomes very special with our romantic partners. Mm. Speaking of romantic partners, yes. let's think of what the brain would look like if we have a heterosexual romantic partner. Yes. Is there any change perceptibly if it's a homosexual romantic partner? You know, we find the exact same, that myriad pattern that I said we find that differentiates across actually research that looks at straight men and gay men and they show them the appropriate Response. target yeah, so okay. from men for straight men it's women for gay men it's men and we find that exact same activation pattern in the brain when we show them the type of the erotic pictures that are related to so their preferred partner their target. regardless of what it is boom right it lights up the same way same activation pattern whether they're gay or straight wow Yep, that's so, great. So where do you think this research is going in the future? I was joking when we were preparing this show that if I could just get a scanner and kind of do this and, and do my own brain scan mm -hmm. of a potential partner, I could find out if they really love me or if it's just desire. But where are we going with this? Well, in theory, I think if you can get an MRI and some hormone levels, you probably could decide at least if there's a future for a little bit. Certainly th that would come through, but there are some also some self-report measures that are good, not just, hey, do you like me, mm -hmm. but that are much more specific based on this research that we can find out things about what people really prefer and understand where they're going. And you see some of those um, come out into the commercial area as well as staying in the scientific area. Well, I don't think the mystery of love is going to be solved in this segment, but it's, it's promising not. to hear that there's really hard evidence that points to the differences between desire and love. and Commitment is certainly part of the issue. Absolutely. Um, at SUNY Cobleskill, you have yes. some good news. I do. I and that news is? Great news. Um, we have an applied psychology bachelor's program that has um, gone through the vetting process, and we finally got our approval. So, you know, sometimes things take a little bit longer, but 
nice, you know, they're worth the wait sometimes. Talk about commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so we're really, really excited. It's a bachelor's program in applied psychology. Okay, and what is applied psychology? It's not a typical psychology degree in the sense that you would see at a, a comprehensive college. No, the comprehensive colleges are going to have a much more theoretical basis throughout. Our program is much more applied throughout, which means we're going to get some of that theory in early on, but then we're going to take that theory and really apply it both in the classroom and give students a very applied experience outside of the classroom. They're going to be working in their field for a good number of hours, probably close to 800 hours before they're done with the program. And they're expected really, students who want this program are looking for a bachelor's program that they're going to be done with school after their bachelor's degree. Well, let's hope some of your future students who are out there today could come and discover more about love. That Imagine would be great. that. Imagine getting a grade based upon what you find out about love. I and I could come back and then I'd have incontrovertible evidence. There we go. <laughs> well, Amy Corbett, it's been wonderful to have you here on Impact, and I hope you loved this segment. <laughs> Thanks so much, Barbara. You've been watching the science segment here on Impact. We've just been talking with Amy Corbett about love. If you'd like to contact us at Impact, it is simple, impact at proctors.org.